of how perception works. You wouldn't have been able to make any sense of what you saw until you reached the point where you actually could put it in a category, like the Chinese provinces pavilion. That's just what happened when you saw that. Or when you would finally make sense out of the dove, for example. So my talk will be focusing on perception, and uh, in that regard, I will tackle the topic of China now in a totally different perspective than the other uh, presenters before. But let me start off with an example first. I'm a member of the Malcolm Foundation, a fellow myself for a couple of years already. Um, five years ago, actually, I attended another symposium right here in Hangzhou in, um, in the Zhejiang province um, and the university here. And on one of the days, we had an outing to a temple, and there was one picture taken, and many of the Malcolm fellows remember that picture. It was taken on the temple steps um, here in Hangzhou, and there are many people in there. And I had one of these versions of the pictures, and I just uploaded it to Facebook. And what you can do there, you can tag people in the pictures. And I tried to do that, and it worked in most of the cases. But I hadn't found out until one of the Chinese fellows told me that I had actually tagged her in the picture, even though she was not there. And I had mistaken her for another one. So what I stumbled across back then was exactly what I'm working on right now. It's the own race bias and face perception. And the own race bias, uh, just to make it short, it means that people are usually better at recognizing faces from their own ethnicity compared to faces from any other ethnicity. And it's regardless of the ethnicity you belong to, it's a universal problem. Now, what do I as a scientist do about that? I can't just ask people about autobiographical stories, which are nice, but are not leading me to any uh, data. So right here, I would like to demonstrate to you uh, what I usually do in my studies so that you can follow me through to my talk. And I would like to ask you uh, to help me here. So first, I will ask you to um, memorize all the faces I'm going to present to you right now. And uh, you need to memorize them uh, profoundly because I will uh, show you another set of faces afterwards. And you need to pick out the ones you have seen before from the ones you have never seen before. So pay attention to the pictures. Okay, here we go. So you saw all the faces. I hope you kind of liked to um, memorize them. So now I will ask you um, to please count the number of faces that you will see um, in the next uh, short presentation uh, and that you will think of that you have seen them before. You know, the faces you have just seen, pick them out from the other faces and count the number. Okay, so uh, I will just um, do a poll of the um, audience here. Um, who of you saw three faces? Maybe raise your hands. Okay, not too many of what I can see from up here. Um, who of you saw four faces to be repeated? Okay. Um, who saw five faces? Okay, that's a number of hands. Uh, who saw six faces or more? Uh, you people. <laughs> and who didn't see any faces? Who didn't recognize anyone? Oh, come on, you can dare to raise your hand. Okay. Um, to make a long story short, there were four faces repeating. Okay, so the ones among you who uh, hopefully picked out the right faces, I congratulate you. Um, the other ones, I think you have to work on your face recognition skills. But you're on a good way, because you might just be in the right spot. So, um, let me explain to you what my research is about. You know, the own race bias, people generally can subsume it in just one sentence. They all look the same to me. And that includes all the people that are not from the same ethnic group. And, um, you know, I've just told, uh, shown you a, an example how we uh, can measure that. 
And technically speaking, it's just a measure of performance for recognition uh, and a difference measure for recognition of own race faces and other race faces. And there are many people who say, okay, where does this come from? And it's probably and most presumably an effect of experience. So you grow up in, an, uh, in a society that is mainly um, inhabited by people just from the same ethnic background as you are. Um, so what you learn is to recognize faces, but just not any faces, but faces that surround you. If you're a Caucasian like me or a European, you're mostly um, the best with faces that share the same physical features um, as the people surrounding you. If you're a Chinese growing up in China, you're probably best with faces that have dark hair and dark eyes, which differs from what is apparently the case in Europe. So experience plays a fundamental role in the own race bias. And um, being a psychologist, I didn't just want to look into uh, behavioral processing of faces, but actually I'm in the neurosciences. So um, a really good question uh, regarding biases such as this one is, okay, there are behavioral effect, but what is below, you know, what, what causes these effects? Is it a memory problem? Is it a processing problem that could be very basic? <coughs> so what I usually do is I measure face processing, on a very basic, on the brain base, uh, level. <coughs> and now it's going to get a little technical, I hope you can stay with me. What I do with my uh, participants in my studies is I invite them to the laboratory. Um, I fit them out with a very stylish cap um, that has place for sometimes 32, sometimes 144 tiny electrodes that can measure the electrical potential that you can um, record from the scalp, from the skin of the head. You put these electrodes on your participants, you put them in a chamber where there's no other electrical field, and while they uh, do something as you just did, whether recognizing the faces or memorizing faces, I just simply record what's already there. And what I get out of is something very beautiful, looks like this. So you see a huge mess of data here, that's one continuous EEG flutter. Actually, it's just a few seconds of what happens in a 40-minute experiment, for instance. Now, what do I do out of that? I can't just, you know, pick whatever point in time I like. Um, and here it's um, with the help of computers that I go on and a little bit further. Because every time I show a picture, the computer puts a little signal into my big file. And actually the signals differ depending on, for instance, if I show a Caucasian face, which would be a European face, or an Asian face. And afterwards, I can actually cut out parts of this continuous EEG file, which is an electroencephalogram, that's the technology we're using here. And I arrive at something that looks like this. Now this looks much more orderly. And what happens if I cut out the pieces of the EEG for each condition and I average them within this condition, all the noise that was there before disappears. That's just a statistical effect of averaging. And what I get is a very clean signal. And actually, that signal, uh, I'm interested in only the areas that I just circled here. Those are the areas where face perception happens in the human brain. And they are pretty much on the back of the head. Um, I'm not going to use the technical terms here. So maybe just try to remember behind your ears, that's what you're looking for. So. Um, that's how, you know, this is a time frame of maybe like 400 milliseconds starting with the presentation of a face. And I only look at the early phases of, uh, of face processing st stages. So what I'm interested in my research are the basic processing uh, activities happening at around 200 milliseconds. And that's where most of the stuff happens that is automatic and you cannot do anything about it, it's unconscious. But this is where the first basis of the own race bias lies. So, um, I'll just shortly point out the two red um, circled areas. There's something that's called the N170. And that's a component of the event-related potential, the, the waveforms we see here, it's called an event-related potential. And the N170 basically stands for the process 
that you can make sense out of a stimulus that has two eyes above the nose, above the mouth. And what we usually call that stimulus is a face. And um, so that first stage is important for you to actually make sense out of the randomness of everything that surrounds us. If that process is not working, you cannot recognize people. You cannot pick up people from other stimuli around you. Now the second process I'm talking about is the P2, as we call it. Uh, and the P2 is actually right after these uh, other stages, 40 milliseconds later. So it's, you know, it happens in a whisk. And um, there we actually have the beginning of identification processes. So once you make sense of all of the stimulus, know that it's a face. The brain will start searching for stimulus material in your memory that resembles that stimulus. And that's actually the basis for recognition. You know, you have to fit an outside stimulus to something that's stored. If, it, if there's no fit, it's a new face. If there is a fit, you know that face. Okay, now let me go to what I was researching on starting four years ago. That's a long time. Um, that was actually my diploma thesis, and I happened to stumble across the whole concept of the on-race bias back then, and I tried to um, combine it with what I see here in the Malcolm Foundation, that we have um, exposure to people from different backgrounds, and we have to interact with them, and that's fun. But it's just, you know, you're forced to uh, be able to recognize these people. So maybe in a, interacting with people from different backgrounds is enough to even just a little bit affect that experience-driven bias of the own race bias, that decrement in recognition abilities in people all over the world. So even though we do not accumulate um, 10,000 hours of practice with other race faces, as Malcolm Gladwell would suggest to make us experts, maybe people in the Malcolm Foundation, if they have spent a, a while there, they might be good enough to just be a little better than the average person in recognizing faces. So what I was looking for is, is there an effect of expertise on your race bias? If I look at, you know, if I compare people with different levels of expertise, and is there an effect on neural processing of uh, faces from different ethnicities? You know, faces from our own ethnicity and faces from another ethnicity that we have expertise with. Okay, so um, in my study, I, I set off to uh, compare the effects of um, the own race bias in a group of experts. They're, um, um, since I, they don't have probably 10,000 hours of practice, I put them in these asterisks. And um, freshmen. With freshmen, I really mean college freshmen, psychology students, they have to come to our experiments, which is quite good for us. And um, we just put them through the test. And on the other hand, I had to convince a lot of um, senior fellows from the Malcolm Foundation. That is because I could make sure that they had spent at least, at least three years interacting with people from other cultures. And interacting for three years is enough, but actually their interaction was limited to uh, maybe, say, 50, 60 people, and only a third or a fifth of them was Chinese. So you see where I'm going here. Um, expertise in that context is very limited, but maybe it's enough, and that's what I tried to explore. And lo and behold, they are better. And they are not better only for Asian faces, but they are better for Caucasian faces as well, which makes them better face recognizers in general. So, um, but what happened on the neural front? Is there anything there? And now just bear with me if I show you the next slide. I'll, you know, quickly skip over it, but I just want you to see something. Um, you see control participants, which are the freshmen on the top, and you see our experts uh, on the bottom. And the um, effects I want to show you, they are circled in blue. So we have something going on in that first stage I told, about, told you about, which is the making sense of the stimulus as a face. And we have something going on that differs between the groups in the second phase, which is the one where you start looking for sim uh, similar stimulus patterns. 
we have inferior face detection in both groups when it comes to the Asian faces, which is the group they all, both have less experience with, but the experts are better, you know, they have more um, exposure to Asian faces. But the, the groups don't differ on that uh, first stage, with it, which is a fifth of a second after presenting a face. So they're both worse for the other race, and there's currently no effect of expertise on that one. But the interesting thing is, um, whereas the control group shows ineffective processing um, of these identity-relevant information in faces, which is, you know, what I told you about the stage where the brain starts looking for a similar pattern in its memory store, whereas that is ineffective uh, for the Asian faces in the control group, the experts show nothing of the same. And that um, goes in line with better behavior on their side. So expertise seems to lower the own race bias, which is a good thing because you get better at recognizing faces. It also affects early neural processing, which is something that you wouldn't expect um, with just limited exposure to these faces, and which speaks for a very basic uh, underlying uh, nature of, of processing uh, differences for uh, as the cause of the own race bias. So probably own race bias is not only caused by memory problems, but it's caused by defunct encoding of faces that differ from what you have experience with. And um, so where does it all leave us? You know, what what's the what's the practical relevance of this own race bias thing? Um, well, if you think about the problem I, I told you at the beginning, you know, with wrong tagging of names in Facebook, that is something that's just embarrassing. And I can deal with that. Um, well, when it gets more serious, if you look into um, situations like courtroom uh, process. So, for instance, uh, imagine a case where there's like a criminal offender, he's in front of the court, and um, the, there's an eyewitness account. And, uh, but the eyewitness is from a different ethnicity than the, the perpetrator. Um, there's a high chance that this eyewitness account will be uh, wrong. And it could be that the perpetrator is judged based on a wrong eyewitness account and could go to jail. Um, so research into the arrest bias, they just look for causes of this, they try to solve it, or if there is no quick fix, um, this information is relevant to people in the law enforcement. And with that, I hope um, you can go out and um, try to um, uh, accumulate as much exposure to other faces, um, try to be better face recognizers, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>